Greetings class and welcome to the seventh lecture presentation for the philosophy of religion course. The title of this lecture presentation is Concepts of Atheism and Secularism. I prepared a PowerPoint presentation for this lecture, so I will share the screen. So as stated earlier, the uh, title for this lecture presentation is Concepts of Atheism and Secularism. And much like the first presentation called uh, Concepts of God, the primary task of this lecture presentation is hermeneutical in nature, meaning that we're going to be looking at varieties of concepts of both atheism and secularism. And one of the primary goals is just to understand how people utilize them uh, when you're reading literature or engaged in uh, philosophical conversations. So there's quite a few varieties of concepts we won't be reviewing all of them, but I thought we'd review some of the uh, main concepts and some of the most interesting ones in this lecture presentation. So a simple definition of atheism, um, and the simple definitions can be uh, deceiving, but it's generally good to start somewhere, is the belief that there is no God. And this was taken from the big questions text, which you're all familiar with. This was taken from the glossary. And I also believe that when we're looking at the concept of God, this definition was given. So atheism is the belief that there is no God. So some of the uh, varieties of concepts for understanding atheism, and this will essentially function as the outline of the presentation. I'll just list these and then we'll go over each in detail. So early concepts of atheism was understood as ungodliness. Then there became atheism as a philosophical position during the enlightenment. This would be understood as a defensible philosophical position. Then uh, somewhat recently, uh, it's this position as atheism as a philosophical position, but also as a positive moral decision-making. And this is understood in the positions of what is sometimes referred to as the new atheist. Uh, what Prothero in his text, uh, God is not one refers to as the angry atheist. Then there's atheism as, uh, as one position within pluralism, often called the friendly atheist. Their focus is more just toleration toward atheists. Uh, there's atheism as a form of religion. We'll explore this philosophical question. Uh, can atheism outside of the Dharmic context be understood as a form of religion pragmatically? We'll look at an interview by William James, or presented in William James' variety of religious experience. It's not an interview he himself conducts. Then we have atheism, and this is sort of understood as science, as a utopic substitution for religion or God, often found in utopian literature. The example I'll provide is from Walden too. And then finally, we have atheism as a descriptive position in the religious beliefs and religious traditions of uh, Jainism and some forms of Buddhism. So we'll get started and we'll proceed in this order. When we're done with this, we'll look at a similar outline for secularism. So early concept of atheism as ungodliness. Uh, this was taken from uh, the work, The Myth of Disenchantment by uh, Josephson Storm. So a fascinating work, I, I recommend it. And he writes, the term atheism had entered uh, modern Europe, European languages by way of French only in the mid 16th century as a rehabilitation of the Greek word atheos, uh, often translated as godless or impious. But initially it was used to refer to any kind of intellectual, moral or behavioral ungodliness. During this time, quote, uh, belief in God was thought to be an inborn trait and the existence of God such an obvious fact that atheism could only be asserted through a kind of bad faith or self-deception motivated by cardinal passions. So this was the early use and then it becomes a viable philosophical position, much like some of the philosophical positions we've been exploring earlier, right? Uh, atheism as a uh, viable philosophical position during the enlightenment. This happens particularly with uh, Jacobi when uh, exploring the implications of the controversy on Spinoza and his philosophy, also known as the Spinozistic um, controversy or the controversy involving Spinozism, right? And so Jacobi is exploring the implication of Spinoza's philosophy, particularly after uh, Lessing was uh, understood to possibly believe it. It wasn't clear whether Spinoza's position was pantheism or atheism, 
where Jacobi explored his position, particularly in the phrase ex nihilo nihil uh, fit or uh, nothing uh, comes out of nothing. And it's utilizing the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, this is a quote from, again, the myth of disenchantment. Ex nihilo nihil fit out, um, nothing comes from nothing. At first glance, this principle might suggest merely that the world is rational and nothing happens without a reason. But Jacobi understood this, the principle of sufficient reason in terms of proximate or mechanical causation, stating, we conceive of a thing if we can derive it from its proximate causes, or if we can grasp its immediate conditions in a series, what we grasp or derive in this manner gives us a mechanical condition. And so this was a problem for Jacobi because if every event happened due to an earlier determinate cause, there was no longer any room for freedom and hence no room for ethics or miracles, hence no room for God. That is for Jacobi. If natural philosophy is right and everything has a proximate cause, then the universe is deterministic and we are nothing but clockwork automatons imprisoned in, mechanical, uh, in a mechanical cosmos. And so with this extrapolation of Spinoza's philosophy, Jacobi finds that the rational position is atheism. Now, he was not an atheist. He was saying that, that faith involved belief. And so, so faith in God is, is the alternative or piety. Um, whereas the um, approach from reason is atheism. And this is where we get in the, um, in the uh, modern enlightenment era, uh, understandings of atheism as a philosophical position. Now, other ideas we've explored that might result in atheism is such as the problem of evil. But this uh, idea of atheism from the philosophical justification came prior to that. And as we earlier looked at arguments for and against the concept of God, those ideas um, for counter arguments derived here as well. Then we look at some of the more contemporary ideas involving atheism. And this is atheism as a philosophical position, so derived out of reason, uh, but also with more implications. So this type of atheism, also referred to as the new atheism, um, and what Prothero refers to as angry atheism, or atheists who become angry at the existence of religion, um, argue that atheism is the correct philosophical position when one applies reason to experience. This position is often uh, grounded in scientific, scientific materialism. This idea being that materialism is the belief that all that exists is matter, is movements and modifications, and that science helps us understand this and ultimately helps us uh, understand the world. This position also uh, believes that religion is harmful to society and that to create a better society, religion would have to be absent. Uh, some examples of these atheists that uh, Stephen Prothero provides in the uh, final chapter of his work, God is Not One, entitled A Brief Coda on Atheism. Some examples of these atheists are uh, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Bennett. Atheism, the next type of atheism is atheism as one position within uh, pluralism. These are often called the uh, friendly atheists. This quote is taken from Prothero's text as well. And he writes, advocates of this perspective present atheism, not as the infallible truth, but as a valid point of view deserving of a fair hearing. Their, their goal is not a world without religion, but a world in which believers and non-believers coexist in a spirit of mutual toleration. And so this is just one view in a pluralistic universe, whereas the former view, perhaps the former two views we've explored uh, sort of see more of a correct and incorrect answer to, from reason, atheism in this perspective being the correct answer. Um, in the former faith uh, uh, being an alternative uh, belief system, but not as not um, uh, with the aid of reason, because as Jacobi noted, that um, reason results in atheism, given what Spinoza said. So here we get to an other interesting take, this idea of can religion 
uh, I'm sorry, can atheism be understood as a form of religion? And here when I say atheism, I mean outside of the Dharmic contexts of Jain and Buddhist uh, philosophical religious belief. Um, and so here we have an example of an interview uh, of an atheist that William James provides to us in the um, varieties of religious experiencing, experiences, commenting on this uh, individual, James explains, we have in him, the atheist being interviewed, an excellent example of the optimism which may be encouraged by popular science. And so James again defines religion as one's total reaction upon life. We looked at this in a former video. He also divides the um, religious um, psychological aspects of a person's belief into the health and mind, healthy mindedness and the sick soul. Um, and he's giving this atheist as an example of a religious belief system, a total reaction upon life, which is ultimately healthy. And so I'll go ahead and read some highlights from the interview to uh, show to everyone. So the atheist has asked this question, what does religion mean to you? He replies, it means nothing. And it seems so far as I can observe, useless to others. Consequently, I have some little experience of life and men and some women too. And I find that the most religious and pious people are as a rule, those most lacking in uprightness and morality. The men who do not go to church or have any religious conviction are the best. And so here we see some uh, ideas in some of the former atheisms we were described. The interview continues. What comes to your mind or what comes before your mind corresponding to the words God, heaven, angels, etc.? And he replies, nothing whatever. I am a man without a religion. These words mean so much mythic bosh. The interview continued. Have you ever experienced, have you ever had any experience which appeared providential? He replies, none whatever. There is no agency of any superintending kind. A little judicious observation, as well as knowledge of scientific law, will convince anyone of this fact. Question, what things work most strongly on your emotions? After describing uh, plays and music and exercise, the atheist continues, all my thoughts and cogitations have been of the healthy and cheerful kind. For instead of doubts and fear, I see things as they are, for I endeavor to adjust myself to my environment. This I regard is the deepest law. Mankind is a progressive animal. I am satisfied that he will have made a great advance over his present status a thousand years hence. And here we start to see how James understands this as a total positive reaction toward life, putting this person in the category of the healthy mindedness and perhaps of a religious experience. This can also be described as forms of humanism. Then the atheist is asked, what is your notion of sin? He replies, it seems to me that sin is a condition, a disease incidental of man's development, not yet being advanced enough. Morbidness over it increases the disease. We should think that in a million of years hence, equity, justice, and mental and physical good order will be so fixed and organized that no one will have any idea of evil or sin. And so basically, he, he understands um, our human progression. Here we might detect some aspects of evolutionism discussed in former uh, uh, lectures as bringing us into some type of humanistic utopia. And again, James is saying this is a total reaction upon life and a very healthy minded one. So this um, is perhaps material for considering atheistic belief outside of the Dharmic uh, context as, as religious belief. This is a fascinating question to ponder. Next, we have an example from literature as atheism understood as science as a utopic substitution for religion, God, in utopian literature. Now, this example is given from Walden II, written by B.F. Skinner, who was a behavioral scientist. In this novel, we have an individual known as Fraser, who is sort of like a super behavioral scientist. Fraser has discovered and perfected the science of behavior. And so he can utilize these principles of human behavior to make humans do whatever he wants, but all he wants, he says, is the best for humanity. And so he uses these principles to make human beings cooperate and basically live in a utopia. Another scientist, a psychologist named Burris, 
is going to Fraser Utopian community to decide if he wants to live there. And he is sort of asking Fraser these questions about this utopian community. Obviously, this is a complete restructuring of social behavior. And so Burris is quite, uh, has a lot of questions. Toward the end of the novel, uh, Burris is walking up a hill and on this hill, Fraser, the, utop the creator of this community using behavioral science has a telescope and he's looking over the community kind of like how we might imagine a God looking over creation. He lays down on the ground, relaxing, and his hands are sort of stretched out, almost like he's being crucified. Um, and Burris sort of makes a comment where you, he says, you kind of look like uh, Christ crucified the way you're, you're um, laying there. And, and uh, Fraser says, there is some uh, uh, um, resemblance. And then this is where the dialogue picks up. Burris says, just so you don't think you're God. And then Fraser replies, there is a curious similarity, Burris rather considerably less control in your case, I should imagine. Fraser, not at all, at least if we can believe the theologians. On the contrary, it's the other way around. You may remember that God's children are always disappointing him. Burris, then Castle, a philosopher who was debating Fraser earlier, was right. You're a dictator after all. Fraser, no more than God, or rather less so, generally, I've let things alone. I've never stopped, stepped in to wipe out the evil works of men with a great flood, nor have I sent a personal emissary to reveal my plan and to put my people back on track. The original design took deviations into account and provided automatic correction. It's rather an improvement upon Genesis. And so we can see here in a utopian uh, science fiction, science sort of takes the place of God in a lot of ways and the scientists might take the place of God in this idea. So this is sort of a um, account of atheism based in a utopic uh, literature in which science comes to take the place of God. And there's a lot of re religious imagery as well. Uh, later, this character Fraser will say that he loves the people of his community and love and positive reinforcement, that behavioral, uh, behaviorist principle are the same thing. So we have fascinating uh, substitutions here. Finally, we have um, atheism in the, uh, uh, as a uh, philosophical uh, position of religious belief in Jain and Buddhist Dharma. And this is quite different from all the other uh, ones understood prior. So uh, these are religious traditions and these religious traditions un uh, understand atheism in the Dharmic context. So we might hear the same word, but it is radically different in, in a lot of the applications. First, there is a belief in karma and the eternal nature of the universe. So there's no creator of the universe. The universe always existed and it operates under the principle of karma uh, in which all actions have uh, more implications and reactions. There's also a belief that liberation requires self-effort in uh, Jainism and in many forms of Buddhism and the correct understanding of reality and moral behavior is also necessary. And so there's not a reliance in a personal God which can save one. And finally, there is no uh, belief in the existence of a creator God in a theistic sense. And that's where the term atheistic comes from. It is through self-effort and uh, correct moral behavior that one achieves liberations most likely over many, many lifetimes. And so these are just some of the concepts of atheism. And it's very important to, uh, when we read different philosophical literature and, and religious texts and listen to uh, popular religious discussions, that we try to understand what, when we hear the word atheism, what type of atheism the author intends um, uh, to be communicating. We see a, a rich variety of the term here. Now let's uh, move to the, uh, concept of secularism or the concepts. Uh, so the outline here, we'll look at a um, simple definition, perhaps somewhat deceiving given the varieties. Then we'll look at uh, um, Holyoke's uh, coining of the term, then uh, Holyoke's um, three principles of secularism. We'll look after that at contemporary applications of Anakantavada as secularism, Anakantavada and Indian secularism after that. 
and then anthropological considerations concerning political secularism, and then finally pluralism and political secularism. And then I'll ask three questions that I hope can sort of summarize some of the interesting parts. So a uh, definition of secularism just found in the Merriam-Webster online uh, dictionary is an indifference to or rejection or exclusion of religion and religious consideration. So we have quite a few different qualifications and ideas here. Let us go uh, proceed how the term was coined. So the term secularism was coined in 1851 by George Jacob uh, Holyoke. And according to Holyoke, uh, secularism is not about being against religion. Rather, it is something positive, a personal orientation uh, predicated on a this-worldly ethos that is guiding beliefs and principled ideals that are concerned with the here and now, people and nature, life and existence. And this quote was taken by Living the Secular Life by a sociologist of religion, uh, Phil Zuckerman. Uh, this quote was also found in that. So uh, Holyoke's three um, principles of secularism. So Holyoke explained, um, secularism is a code of duty pertaining to this life, founded on considerations purely human and intended mainly for those who find theology indefinite or inadequate, unreliable or unbelievable. Its essential principles are three. One, the improvement of this life by material means. Two, that science is the available providence of man. And three, that it is good to do good, whether there be other good or not. The good of the present life is good, and it is good to seek that good. This quote was also found in Living the Secular Life. We'll move now to a uh, different understanding of secularism. This comes from contemporary applications of Anakantabada, particularly by an article by uh, Kamla Jayan. And here we have um, an explanation of some of the insights in this article. Commenting on the concept of Anakant in our present day social context, Kamla Jayan compares Anakant to the nuanced understanding of secularism. Jayan explains that, quote, in modern social contexts, there cannot be a better interpretation of Anakant than secularism. It is the modern social philosophical definition of Anakant, which Jayan defines as respect for all religions. Describing secularism as ideally embodied in the secular state, Jayan explains that, quote, a secular state project a secular state projects all religions equally and favors none at the expense of others. The state recognizes equal rights and privileges and duties as belonging to all citizens, irrespective of their religion, religion or caste. So this is a concept in which she uh, believes that Anakant and secularism, particular in the ideal secular state, share, so much so that they interpret each other. Uh, this understanding of secularism is particular to Indian secularism, in which Richard King defines as taken from the contemporary Indian politics and influenced by Indian reformers, such as Gandhi and Swami Vivekananda, and bases itself upon the principle of Sarva Dhamma Sambhava, uh, Sambhava uh, often loosely translated as let all religious, religions prosper. And so this understanding of secularism is a space in which all religions uh, can equally prosper. And the government uh, is structured in such that um, religions can do this. We also, given this, this idea of um, secularism in relation to the secular state in religion, in relation to um, um, a state in which there are multiple religions practice, uh, I thought I would also share uh, anthropological considerations uh, from the work Religious Difference in a Secular Age by Saba Mahmood, who is an anthropologist of secularism. And so Saba Mahmood explains that secularism in the following way, stating that she conceptualizes political secularism as the modern state's sovereign power to reorganize substantive features of religious life, stipulating what religion is or ought to be, assigning its proper content and disseminating concomitant subjectivities, ethical frameworks, and prudentum practices. 
Secularism in this understanding is not simply the organizing structure for what are regularly taken to be a priori elements of social organization, private, public, political, religious, but a discursive operation of power that generates these very spheres, establishes their boundaries, and suffices them with content such that they acquire a natural quality for those living within their terms. So perhaps the worry contained in this insight concerning secularism and secular democracies is that the amount of pluralism a society is able to experience and foster must be mediated by the power of the state, um, a power greatly influenced by religious majority within the society. The influence of the religious majority also takes their particular norms, laws, uh, norms and laws, um, also makes their particular norms and laws appear more natural and less in need of justification than those of religious minorities. This is a fascinating idea. Whereas a secularism from nowhere, which is sort of just a uh, concept such as a view from nowhere, often popularized by Thomas Nagel, right? This this idea of, of secularism in and of itself, which may or perhaps not really exist if we look at genealogies of secularism, might suggest equal justification for every norm or law, even if there is coincidence of overlapping consensus. So this, again, I hope provides a variety of concepts of secularism understood uh, in, in distinction from religion, as understood uh, from religious concepts, as understood anthropologically in societies that are secular democracies in which there are religious uh, majority and religious minorities coexisting, in which uh, the aim is equal freedom of religious expression for all. Finally, I thought I would share a few questions that I thought might summarize some of the points uh, made uh, between these concepts of atheism and secularism within the context, the larger context of the philosophy of religion. But I thought of three further questions that I thought might be interesting to ponder. Does it make sense to think of atheistic beliefs, again, outside of the context of the Dharmic context of Jain and, and Buddhist beliefs as religious beliefs? So does it make sense to think of atheistic beliefs as religious beliefs? We have some aspects of why, given from the uh, interview provided in the William James uh, text, but that has much to do with the concept of religion and the definition of religion, which the first lecture and the fifth lecture often uh, provided a variety of definition of religions, right? So that's the first question. Question two, what is occurring philosophically when one uses a religious concept like Anakantavada to understand secularism? This I think is also a fascinating question to ask. And finally, this aspect has to do with philosophical secularism, but also uh, involves the concept of political secularism. Is there an essential difference between a secular government made up of religious individuals and a secular government made up of non-religious individuals? So these are three questions I thought were fascinating questions given the variety of concepts of both atheism and secularism. Okay, so I hope this lecture was uh, uh, very helpful. Um, and we only have one more left, and that will be on concepts of the afterlife. So uh, again, I hope you enjoyed the lecture and take care.